in gift deeds. Um, gift deeds will be on view at PAFA until January 8th, 2023. And what's exciting about today's program is that we get to dive into one of the collections, uh, the works gifted to PAFA, um, by Ophelia Garcia, uh, who is a print collector, um, scholar, arts administrator, world crafter, who joins us today as part of this presentation. Um, and Christina and I will be talking about Atelier 17, the women, um, the women of Atelier 17, several of whom have works in PAFA's permanent collection, um, and a few of whom have works in gift deeds. But I want to start by uh, just giving a bit of an overview of the exhibition to um, just to give you a bit of a teaser to understand um, what you might see when you come to PAFA. Um, so in our works on paper gallery, this is a celebration of prints. Um, I think that one of the things that's incredibly interesting about the way we talk about printmaking is that the idea that print is a collaborative um, media that it's it's a democratic media, but I think that there's a there's a way that we can talk really richly about what collaboration looks like in the arts as we move through space like this and think about how artists practice on paper, whether that's work that they made in watercolor or drawing um, or printmaking can be really expansive and thoughtful. Um, and this is just a little bit of a teaser to get you to come to PAPA and see the exhibition um, and spend some time with the works. Um, and just, you know, appreciate the, the breadth of visual influences that all of these artists are drawing on in this exhibition um, before I turn our conversation over to our esteemed scholar joining us today. Um, so today we will be talking to Christina Weil, who is an independent scholar and curator with expertise on 20th century American printmaking. Dr. Weil received her BA from Georgetown University and her MA and PhD in art history from Rutgers. Her recent book, The Women of Italia 17, Modernist Printmaking in Mid-Century New York, published on Yale University Press, highlights the nearly 100 women artists who advanced modernism and feminism at Italia 17, the avant-garde printmaking studio located in New York City between 1940 and 1955. With the support of a major grant from the Getty Foundation, she is currently co-curating an exhibition with Lauren Rosenblum for the International Print Center of New York, focusing on Margaret Lohengrund and her pioneering effort to establish the contemporaries as a hybrid printmaking workshop slash gallery. Dr. Weil has published in Art in Print, Print Quarterly, and Archives of American Art Journal, and contributed to several anthologies and exhibition catalogs. From 2014 to 2018, she served as co-president of the Association of Print Scholars, a nonprofit professional organization she co-founded in 2014. And prior to her graduate studies, she worked for Gemini GEL at Joni Moissant Weil, which represents the publications of the Los Angeles-based artist workshop, Gemini GEL. And without further ado, um, I would love to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Weil. Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you um, to you and Lori for inviting me to speak today. Um, I just want to say if at any point, Lori, my uh, connection uh, fails, just please let me know and um, we'll try to see what we can do. I moved, so hopefully it'll be better. Um, let me screen share. Okay. Oops. All right. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm, as I said, very happy to be here um, speaking to you and appreciate the opportunity to um, talk to this community um, at PEFA. Um, as both alluded to, I'm going to speak about women artists who were active at mid-century, who were members of Atelier 17, which was this avant-garde printmaking studio um, in New York, and we'll talk a little more about what Atelier 17 was. Several of the women who I'm going to speak about today are part of the Ophelia Garcia collection, 
Um, but what I really want to draw out today are the networks of sisterhood that these women built inside mid-century print studios um, that fostered lifelong friendships and spurred professional development. Um, Atelier 17 was a relatively egalitarian um, institution with fewer barriers to entry for women. Um, and it offered extraordinary opportunities for professional advancement, which these artists welcomed as gender e e equity um, and equality were otherwise incredibly limited um, elsewhere in the arts community at mid-century. So before I dive into the case studies I have, I just wanted to give this quick overview of what Atelier 17 is since I, or was, since I imagine there are some attendees who may not be familiar with it. Um, Atelier 17 was an experimental printmaking studio that was founded by uh, Stanley William Hayter, um, who you can see here in his um, full glory. Uh, he had a passion for, uh, for engraving in particular, but printmaking in general. Um, he was a charismatic character uh, and um, probably the only thing that rivaled his love of printmaking was his uh, love of tennis. Um, Atelier 17 opened in interwar Paris in 1927. Uh, it moved to New York City in 1940. Uh, because of World War II, and it remained in New York City till 1955. Uh, the workshop was initially located uh, within a classroom at the New School for Social Research, um, which you can see pictured on the left. Uh, and after five years, Hayter decided to break with the New School and moved Atelier 17 to a loft on East 8th Street, which you can see on the right. Um, and as you can see in this photo on the right, the space was fairly makeshift in comparison with the new school setting with electrical lights held in place by strings and curtains that were falling off their rods. Um, other artists spoke about the um, very noisy and gassy radiators, um, the ink that was all over the place. Um, so you just get a sense of, of the space that artists were working in. The uh, New York studio closed in 1955, but Hayter continued to run the studio back in Paris where he had gone um, after the war ended and Atelier 17 remained open until his death um, in 1988 in Paris. Throughout the studio's 60 years in existence, Atelier 17 trained printmakers pushed the boundaries of what was previously thought possible um, in the graphic arts. They pioneered and perfected new ways of marking, inking, and printing their matrices that revolutionized the printmaking field's somewhat staid reputation and brought it in line with modernist expression. Um, and a couple examples I like to give of what are some key breakthroughs that happened at Atelier 17, particularly in this mid-century period when it was in New York City, are um, illustrated on this slide. On the left, you can see the enlargement of an engraved line. Um, this is a technique that was particularly important to Atelier 17 and to Hayter. Um, but you can see how much that line becomes embossed when it is printed onto a sheet of paper. And that's because the engraved line is so deeply cut into a copper plate. In the center, you can see an example of soft ground etching um, in a print by Sue Fuller that's called uh, Cock. And the soft ground etching is the very lightly gray lace that you see in the back. Typically soft ground etching before Atelier 17 um, was used mostly for transferring a drawing where you would put a sheet of paper over a soft grounded etching plate and then use a very blunt stylus like an eraser or you know something that could um, transfer a line from the paper through the paper to the to the um, to the plate. In any case, artists began to really explore um, different textures that they could put on the plate. And then finally, the example you see on the right is a print by Stanley Hayter called Sang Personage from 1946, which is a breakthrough work 
demonstrating the development of what became known as simultaneous color printmaking, where you'll also see it referred to as viscosity printing, where artists could print multiple colors on the same plate by varying the amount of oil that they put into their ink and varying uh, the rollers and how they roll the ink onto the surface of the plate. So it was a major time-saving um, uh, technique. Otherwise, artists have to print each color with a separate plate. You know, as many colors is as many passes through the press and it's much more time consuming. Um, so my focus today will be to discuss some of the bonds that um, were shared between women artists who worked at Atelier 17 in New York City. Uh, many of these women artists are central to my book. Um, which uh, you can see here. And, and here's the major artists who are um, featured in the book, Louise Bourgeois, Mina Citron, Ward and Day, Dorothy Daner, Sue Fuller, Alice Trumbull Mason, Louise Nevelson, and Anne Ryan. Um, and I focus on these eight because they had the most um, sustained engagement with printmaking. Um, and it was, they had a corpus of works that I could look at, study, um, and also had uh, archives that I could access to learn more about their interactions with printmaking. Um, the argument that my book makes is that these women and others, so there are, we'll see about almost a hundred, um, bent the technical rules of printmaking and blazed uncharted aesthetic terrain with their etchings, engravings, and woodcuts. Uh, and working in Atelier 17 facilitated their engagement with modernist styles and fostered solidarity among these women, which provided, in some cases, inspiration for feminist collective action in the 1960s um, and 70s. And so when I usually talk about what I research, most people will be familiar with um, the two Louises, Louise Bourgeois and Louise Nevelson, um, or they'll know that Atelier 17 was the place where Jackson Pollock made prints or um, other canonical men who were part of the post-war New York school or abstract expressionist movement, such as Robert Motherwell or Mark Rothko. But um, I wanted to know more about the nearly 100 women who, uh, who made prints there. So when I started my research, I worked from a list that was in a 1977 exhibition catalog, which was commemorating the 50th anniversary of Atelier 17's founding. And at that point, there were only 51 women listed on that um, list. But over the course of doing my research, I was able to expand the list to 97 names, which you can see here. But it bothered me a lot that I um, often knew nothing about who these women were besides just a name on the page. Um, who were they and where did they come from? What ambitions drew them to the workshop and how did experimenting with modernist printmaking shape their careers? So as I wrapped up the revisions to my book, I turned my attention to researching each and every single one of these 97 women artists who I had confirmed as being affiliated with the studio. And I tried to write a short bio for each one of them. Um, this became a website, which you can access, um, that's got basically um, short bios. Um, in some cases, it might be just one sentence uh, explaining where these women came from, what I know about them, if they're very, very obscure, I tried to find a picture of them and a picture of their work, um, but I had to search high and low. I looked in traditional art historical uh, reference books. I looked in um, genealogical databases like Ancestry. I had to go through eBay in some cases to find information, um, but I really did want to flush out something about everybody. Um, and I think what I took away from that process is just that some of these women may have had limited contact with Atelier 17 or limited time as uh, artists because of other forces that pulled them towards, um, you know, marriage or, or having children, 
Um, and oftentimes at mid-century, there was no way to have both um, a professional life and a personal life as a woman. Um, and so I just wanted to document, you know, those forces uh, and the way that women often tried to balance many of these things at once. Um, but one of my favorite parts, as you can see, of doing this research for the book and the supplemental website was uncovering a lot of archival documents, which revealed the friendships that women shared with one another, and um, even how small acts of kindness between them could translate into major professional breakthroughs. So I just wanted to share today um, three anecdotes which involve artists uh, represented in Pafa's collection. Um, the first pairing I want to talk about is Anne Ryan and Warden Day, who overlapped at Atelier 17 in the early 1940s. On paper, these artists were very different. Um, the obvious thing is their age discrepancy. Ryan was uh, 23 years older than Day and had um, her own grown children who were roughly Day's age. Um, whereas Day had extensive, um, I should also mention Ryan had no artistic training. Um, Day, uh, in contrast, had had extensive artistic training. She studied art at Randolph-Macon Women's College and later at the Art Students League. Um, and Ryan kind of found her way to New York by way of being a poet. Um, she had raised her children in New Jersey and um, through forces beyond her control um, had to become, you know, um, um, had to earn a living. Um, her husband had uh, mental illness and no longer could provide for her family. So in any case, uh, she moved to Greenwich Village and kind of fell in with a bunch of creative types and eventually became a self-taught artist. Um, many women at Atelier 17 were fiercely uh, persistent in um, finding opportunities to show their prints. Um, fighting for chances to secure uh, relationships with curators and with other key professional contacts who could help advance their careers. And they had a lot of motivation to pursue these uh, connections because the mid-century art world had erected really high walls against you know, women and anybody who was a little bit different. Um, so there were often unofficial quotas. I, I don't wanna say they were official, but many of the top tier galleries that would allow for maybe one or two women to be part of the stable uh, of mostly men, white men. Um, and outside the field of, of um, the field of printmaking, women artists had a lot of trouble finding galleries, particularly the top level galleries like Betty Parsons um, to exhibit their paintings or their sculptures. So this impacted their ability to gain critical notice and market share for their work. Uh, but prints and print exhibitions had lower barriers to entry. Um, this of course comes with a whole bunch of trade-offs, but it was perceived at mid-century as a specialized craft and ranked below painting and sculpture, but that sort of worked to women's advantage. So anyway, um, Anne Ryan maintained several journals throughout her lifetime, uh, and one from 1945 records several pointers from Hayter, but Atelier 17's founder, about achieving commercial viability as a printmaker. Um, he urged her to make a substantial body of prints in order to build a solid foundation in the marketplace. Uh, in this journal, uh, Ryan recorded his advice, quote, reach a goal of 50 good prints and then you will begin to sell, end quote. But he cautioned um, against becoming overly involved in the production of prints and ad advised her to prioritize publicizing her work. Um, then she records in her notebook um, that he suggested, quote, about one third of time is given to the making of prints and two thirds to marketing, mailing, seeing dealers, etc." end quote. So Hayter's advice can only account for so much in affecting the direction of, an, of um, the mid-century um, print market. 
individual artists had to be scrappy and apply themselves doggedly to finding those exhibition and sales opportunities. And Ryan was among the one of the most motivated of Atelier 17, Atelier 17's members. And her notebooks capture an unwavering level of activity. She meticulously recorded uh, the constant comings and goings of her prints to dealers, to exhibitions, um, and she kept an accounting of all of her sales. Um, Cassiopeia, the print that you see on the right and part of the gift uh, to Patha from Ophelia Garcia was among a small group, a group of small uh, circular prints representing the celestial constellations that Ryan created initially at Atelier 17. Um, she worked doggedly to get these prints in front of uh, Una Johnson, who was then Brooklyn Museum's curator of prints, who ended up buying the entire set of constellation prints from Ryan in 1945. Um, and here I'm showing you some, but not all, I will note, of the constellation prints in the Brooklyn Museum's collection. Um, as a newly minted professional artist, uh, I mean, because she really had only become an artist only a few years before, Ryan must have been thrilled to have these works acquired by um, such a prestigious museum. Uh, and it likely emboldened her to pursue additional opportunities to network and to place her prints in museum collections. Um, like Ryan, Warden Day to Cater's model. Yeah. Lori? Okay. Somebody is unmuted, and I just want to make sure you all can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so like uh, Ryan, Warden Day took Hader's model to heart and became a marketing force for her own prints and those by uh, fellow female artists. In 1947, Ryan and Day shared an informal business relationship whereby the 58-year-old Ryan sent prints to the peripatetic Day, who was then 35. Without taking um, a commission, Day entered Ryan's prints into regional exhibitions and showed them to interested curators and collectors. In a postcard to Ryan from an exhibition at Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri, Day, uh, that Day actually had coordinated, she wrote to Ryan of her persistent efforts, quote, I'm really propagandizing people to purchase prints. Um, and then in a later letter, uh, Day described her marketing philosophy to Ryan. Um, she says, I am glad, among other things, she says, I'm glad to have been able to sell some of your prints and I don't expect anything in return. I believe artists should freely help one another for it all helps us in the long run. I heartily disapprove of the highly cutthroat competitive attitudes that most of our American artists regard one another, end quote. So this kind of selfless uh, promotion on behalf of others foregrounds the communal strategies behind women-run galleries during the 1970s, like AIR, Artemisia, ARC, and Women Space. Through uh, Day's marketing, the Art Center Association of Louisville, Kentucky bought Ryan's woodcut tenements, and the Memphis Academy of Arts purchased Jugglers and Fantasia, the latter of which was one of, um, the latter was one of Ryan's first experiments in uh, abstraction. And these are all woodcuts. This is something that Ryan began to experiment with after making etchings at Atelier 17. And I'd be happy to talk about that if people have questions. Um, Ryan also independently marketed her own prints to several venues in the US, in Mexico, and France. But Ryan's and, and Day's collective teamwork and independent efforts were paramount to getting their names known regionally. Um, so beyond Ryan and Day, um, several other artists developed close friendships at Atelier 17 that led to a lifetime of mutual support, encouragement, and solidarity. These relationships often helped women get ahead outside of the male-dominated art gal uh, gallery system and led to important professional achievements. 
Louise Nevelson and Dorothy Daner first met at Atelier 17 in the early 1950s and became lifelong friends and supportive of each other's efforts as sculptors. Daner's career in the 1930s and 40s took a back seat um, to, um, as she supported her, her ambitious husband, the sculptor David Smith, to whom she was married for nearly a quarter century. Although she was extremely well-versed in avant-garde ideas and modernist self-expression, Daner's work during her marriage was predominantly based in realism, as you can see in this beautiful watercolor of the landscape near the couple's home in Bolton Landing in upstate New York. Uh, the couple split in 1950, and Daner's decision to work at Atelier 17 came at an opportune moment for her personally and professionally. On one of her first visits to Atelier 17, which was then located at that space uh, I showed you earlier, um, Daner admired some of Nevelson's express, ex expressively inked uh, etchings that were hanging on the wall. Um, here I'm showing an example from Hoffa's collection where you can see how much excessive um, black ink or excess black ink uh, sort of obscures the linear lines on the plates that um, Nevelson had created. Um, these are when you see a more cleanly wiped uh, example impression from this plate. These are two cats um, and they're sort of sitting inside of a, a circular box. Um, but you can see there's so much ink that it has splotches along the margins. And then at the bottom near where the title is, there's this sort of scrape of ink. Um, in any event, it was prints like this that um, Daner was interested in and introduced herself to Nevelson, and then they became lifelong friends. Um, the experience for Daner of working at Atelier 17 reignited her early artistic attraction to working in three dimensions, something that she had put on pause while married to David Smith, who was making a name for himself as a sculptor. Um, the process of carving into metal plate or etching out deeply bitten areas spurred her transition to sculpture, her exclusive focus for the rest of her um, career. The prints I'm showing you here, which are not in Papa's collection, are meticulously engraved uh, for the triangular or sort of fan-shaped um, forms that you see. Um, Daner controlled her engraved lines um, so that they would come exactly to a beautiful point. And additionally, the areas, particularly in, in um, wingspan, you can see this thick radiant tone was achieved through a tool called roulette, which is just sort of a little wheel that she would run over these areas, but they are quite lovely. Um, though Nevelson became progressively busier with her sort of superstar career as a sculptor, she and Daner were always supportive of one another. Um, shortly after meeting, Daner photo photographed Nevelson's um, sculpture in her home on uh, 30th Street in New York City, which was one of the first times that Nick Nevelson had ever had her work professionally photographed. Uh, and later, uh, when working at uh, the Tamarin Lithography Workshop in 1963, one of the major collaborative work printmaking workshops that was founded in the 60s, um, Nevelson wrote Daner a postcard recommending that she also make prints at Tamarind and likely suggested Daner's name to uh, Tamarind's founder, June Wayne. And here you can see examples of the glorious work that they created there. Um, and I would add that the scale of these prints is much, much, much larger than anything that the artist did at Atelier 17, which shows a sort of growing confidence in their printmaking skills. Um, and so finally, I want to touch on one last pairing, um, Miriam Shapiro and Ellen Lanyon. And to be perfectly upfront, neither of these artists is commonly associated with Atelier 17, but Atelier 17 nevertheless has a significant place in their friendship and how they came to printmaking. Um, Shapiro is best known as a founding matriarch of the feminist art movement, who with Judy Chicago started the feminist art program at 
the California Institute of Art, Arts in the 1970s. Um, and on the right, you can see an example of Shapiro's mature work, um, a collage of a kimono uh, style garment where there's cutouts from fabric um, and acrylic paint. Uh, this is typical of Shapiro's Femage, which is a portmanteau for feminist collage. Um, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, Ellen Lanyon, whose work you see on the left, um, a, a painting that you see on the left, grew to artistic maturity in um, mid-century Chicago and is commonly grouped with um, sort of an amorphous group of artists called the Monster Roster, which was a diverse set of artists working um, in Chicago using abrasive, figurative, and surrealistic styles um, in the immediate post-war years. Lanyon's um, subject matter changed over time um, from city views to uh, nostalgic uh, views of her photographs from, from um, sorry, from the snapshots of her family uh, to images of magic tricks, wildlife, but she maintained a consistent interest in nostalgia, transformation, and metamorphosis. Um, so for works like Azo Pneumatic, um, she drew on her archive of 19th century scientific equipment uh, based on her extensive collection of technical magazines and books and overlaid that with um, this swirling botanical um, image behind it that's in orange. So what do these women have in common? Shapiro and Lanyon actually met each other in the late 1940s at the University of Iowa, where both were involved, where both were enrolled in the print department with Mauricio Lazansky, one of Atelier 17's most illustrious alumni who um, founded Iowa's printmaking program. Um, and here you can see the ever expanding um, circles of Atelier 17's influence as its members opened new workshops. Um, the Iowa Print Group, as the group of artists who trained with Lasansky became known, quickly emerged as another important node of modernist printmaking. Um, these self-portraits that you see by Lanyon and Shapiro were in fact both um, were a core part of, of um, Lazansky's curriculum. Everybody who came through his studio were required to create a self-portrait. Um, importantly, both Lanyon and Shapiro began cultivating their female support networks at the very um, beginning of their careers through their association with mid-century printmaking, and they propelled um, their early careers through these networks of printmaking. Um, although Shapiro's biography often, you know, focuses on her later involvement with the feminist um, art movement, she was quite, quite active in the printmaking field in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and as a graduate student at the University of Iowa in the late 1940s, she even held a professional, uh, an assistantship with um, Mauricio Lazansky. Um, she regularly entered her prints into um, the, the era's many, many, many um, printmaking annuals. Uh, they were group shows that happened at many museums across the US. Um, and prints factored really predominantly in her first solo exhibition held at the Illinois Wesleyan University in 1951. Um, she worked briefly at Atelier 17 in the 1950s after moving to New York City with her husband, the artist Paul Brack. And they spent um, that summer, it's, it's actually an interesting story, they spent that summer that they were in New York uh, sub subleasing Asama Noguchi studio. Um, Shapiro's affiliation with both the Iowa Print Group and Atelier 17 allowed her to develop um, bonds with similarly minded um, independent women. At the University of Iowa, Shapiro and Lanyon met and became lifelong uh, friends. And Lanyon later helped Shapiro jumpstart um, the feminist art movement. As Lanyon remembered in a toast for Shapiro's 70th birthday, quote, we were both feminists before we had a name for it. And Mimi, as Miriam was often called, was the strong, strong and positive mentor to me, end quote. 
Um, and so when Shapiro and her husband left um, Iowa to go to New York, um, Shapiro ensured that Lanyon got her job uh, as the assistant to Lazansky. Um, and I love this photo from the Shapiro archive where you can see Miriam sitting at the table surrounded by fellow uh, artists in the program who seem to be reviewing um, recently pulled um, impressions of prints that have been tucked up on the wall. Uh, 25 years later, Lanyon, Shapiro, Judy Chicago, who was Miriam's collaborator um, at the Feminist Art um, Project, and feminist uh, critic Lucy Lepard founded the West East Bag, which was a short-lived international organization of local affiliates that brought together women artists living one another to meet to organize and to protest their marginalization in the gallery and the museum world. Lanyon ran the Chicago chapter of Webb, as it was called, and Shapiro organized the Los Angeles chapter, because at that point she was out in California, and Lucy Lepard ran the New York branch. But again, it's so interesting that they, they all came back to one another and that these relationships that they, they founded in the, the 50s and the 40s. Um, so although Shapiro and Lanyon involved as separate individuals through the 50s and 60s, I, as I said, I think it's fascinating and really telling that their feminist interactions in the 70s had roots leading back to their exchanges inside the mid-century printmaking studio. Um, so many artists returned to these connections that they had made decades prior inside the messy and ink-filled printmaking laboratories of their youths. Um, nestled within the post-war print community, this vibrant woman-to-woman -woman network carried many of the hallmarks of feminist activism, um, embracing collective advancement and mutual support. Uh, women taught women, women promoted their fellow sisters' new editions or current gallery exhibitions, uh, and they supported each other's business ventures in the print world. Um, whether at Atelier 17 or um, another site like the University of Iowa, uh, these graphic arts workshops had a remarkable, remarkable capacity to nurture these networks of sisterhood that grew over time and in some cases did lay the cornerstone of feminist activism. Um, and I think it's important to remember that feminist art didn't just kind of become this fully formed thing. Uh, but that there were these incremental developments and chance meetings um, and evolving friendships like those that were shared between Lanyon and Shapiro, um, Nevelson and Daner that uh, were essential to generating these component pieces that jump started the movement. Um, and so with that, I wanna stop talking and see if anybody has questions. Um, I'm happy to talk some more with Brittany or answer questions. Yeah, yeah, Christina, I have to thank you so much for that incredibly rich discussion. There's, um, uh, there are a few things that I'm excited to, to dive into and think with you about um, in, in terms of this work. Um, one, I just, uh, you know, I have to drop a link in the chat to this amazing biographical supplement um, platform because of the ways that like it's such a it's such an incredibly generous way to to make sure that the scholarship gets out to the public in a way that's accessible and findable. Um, you know, my uh, co my colleague and curatorial here at PAFA, Anna Marley, is on this Zoom uh, and she and I have co-taught uh, courses um, on women in art and we have so much conversation around just like the difficulty of finding information about artists when you get interested in them and the frustration um, that so many people have had with, you know, if I find incredible work by this artist, why is it so hard to find material about them? Why can't I figure out what their technique was, where they trained, where they exhibited? And so I wanted um, to just really commend you for this platform and also just ask if there were, can you just talk a little bit about how difficult it was to assemble the information when you said you were searching high and low and looking on eBay, I was just really struck by the kind of dogged uh, commitment to hunting down all that information, just the requirement of that and the, the time commitment. Um, so I just love to hear you talk about that a little bit. 
Yeah, it was a hundred percent a labor of love. Nobody paid me to do that. Um, and, I, but I, I wanted to do it. So, you know, some people, some artists were easier than others because some artists have given their papers to archives and that's fantastic. Um, I see we have on the Zoom call uh, the, the granddaughter of one of um, the artists who had the foresight to donate her papers, Minna Citron. Um, and so those were great resources. Hi, how are you? Those are great resources to be able to access. But for others, um, yeah, you're right. It is very frustrating. It is a process. I mean, I had... I had like a million tabs open. I was checking newspaper aggregators. I was checking, you know, internet archive. I was checking everywhere. I even employed my father to do genealogical research for me on, on ancestry because you have to have, I mean, at this point, I'm pretty good at, at finding what I need, but that itself is like a real skill to be able to go into one of these genealogical um websites and know how to find a person and they're there like they are a hundred percent there it's just so frustrating with women who often change their name with marriage um, to find what their given name was when they were born and then to match them up with who they became you know after they married and and all of that and then like track to where they went um so those like teeny tiny little clues um could open up a whole uh, avenue of exploration, like finding where they went to college, then you could go to the university archives and find like a picture of them in the yearbook or find um, student newspapers that might talk about them being enrolled in the art program or what have you, you know, there, the information about these people is out there. It's just hard to find. Yeah, but I think there's there's a really um, impressive way that that kind of meticulous research is like becomes the making of art history in ways that it's easy for um, you know people who are not in the, in the practice of scholarship or in the practice of uh, writing these incredibly rich texts um, might not think about. And so the you know for artists on the call, please save your papers. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that there's I think there's really something to that. Just the that what's what comes through um in a way that's really sort of moving and impressive is not just the stories and the networks you uncover but everything that it requires to do that and so i also um you know, I want to encourage everyone to uh, drop your questions in the chat um, or uh, please use the reaction function to raise your hand if you have a question. Um, but in the meantime, I also was really interested in the way you think about feminism in this work. I mean, I think that there's such a th there's such a great sort of intergenerational conversation happening. And, you know, we talk as curators about um, what women's networks look like in the 20th century? How do we wanna think about um, how to position artists who maybe didn't self-identify as feminists, but engaged in a practice of networking with women um, in acknowledgement of the fact that there were barriers um, to these artists making work and having a sustainable practice as a result of gender. Um, and, and I think that you teased us out in these really um, granular ways. So if I can plug the book for um, people, like one of the things that I think is really interesting is the way you think about, you know, getting dirty, the sort of the inky fingers problem. Um, I think that's really interesting. There's a there's a way that the, the relationship to printmaking um, technology is incredibly gendered. Um, the fact that you know, Anne Ryan has this notebook where she's getting this advice to spend a third of her time making prints and two thirds of her time publicizing her prints. Um, and, and, you know, the ways that we, we know, you know, for, for women who have marriages and, and children, what does that look like? How is that possible? Um, what does it mean that, you know, she has this network of women who, who can take on um, some of that work for her? It, it allows us to have a feminist reading of all of these incredibly rich things that are happening among these women artists, even though they didn't self-identify as feminists. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent, I think, um, you know, I tried not to put the, 
the feminist label onto any of these artists unless they explicitly came out and said that they were. Um, and there were only really, I think, a handful that that were like so um, em embraced that label um, that come from this generation. One in particular would be Minna Citron, who like really even in the 1930s was like, yes, I, she had this amazing show in the 1930s called Femininities, where she was playing with this idea of feminism and the inane that she felt like women in this post suffrage period were like losing their civic engagement. And I see Christy wants to say something, but, um, and, and, and so I think that, that I was very careful not to put that label onto anybody, but to see how some of the activities that they were doing were proto-feminist in a way. Um, I think that's really important to distinguish. Can I say something? Yes, um, please. I, I, what I particularly love about Christina's overall research is um, showing the falseness of this idea that feminist art began in the 70s. It has so driven me crazy when Minna, you know, for many decades before, and as Christine has now shown these other women, I mean, it was definitely um, a strong women uh, feminist thing. And yeah, maybe some of them didn't use the label, but definitely this was going on. And I'm so grateful to Christina for showing that because for many, many years it has, as a feminist myself, um, just driven me crazy when people say, oh, it started in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. I also, and, oh, <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I also appreciate the, the sort of broad lens of even just noting, um, uh, you know, I love the idea of like the black thumb club and the double standards around, you know, if, if men got ink, um, like the inky thumbprints in the margin of their prints, it, it, it signaled something um, different than like the idea that, you know, when women had the inky thumbprint in the margin of the prints, it was like a reflection of a sort of messy technique that didn't, that didn't sort of attach to male production. But even like that, that is something that, that comes from the way artists of the way art critics are writing about the prints or the way the audience are receiving the work that that's not coming from artists I mean that kind of um like the the generation of that as a double standard is, is it's just a sort of fascinating um element to, to this conversation yeah and I would just add in my uh current work about um this other artist mid-century female printmaker Margaret Lohengrund um, you know, she opened a studio in 1951. Um, unfortunately, she died in 1957. So the studio was only open for a brief period. But in going back and looking at a lot of correspondence and memories of her, you know, she does get cast as um, kind of a, I, I mean, just a, a very strong woman, let's say. And but then people throw threw her under the bus, many men being like, well, she had all these dilettantes who were mainly women who were coming in to make prints. And one of her strongest um, supporters uh, has been June Wayne, who of course founded the Tamarind Lithography Workshop, who knew Margaret, knew her work. And she said, why do we call these artists I mean, you know what you're using when you say dilettante, you're talking about women in a pejorative way. And why do we say this? Do you talk about wealthy men coming in and making prints? I can't think of any wealthy woman who would want to come in and get their hands dirty and make a lithograph. Like, I just don't think that that is an appropriate label to be using for women who are, you know, kind of like getting down and dirty and making um, these works of art. So, I mean... It's frustrating. But I could say one more thing. Minna and Minna talked about and I think wrote about that um, she just loved this idea of color printmaking, but that people told her, oh no, you don't want to get into that. It's too difficult and it's really going to be frustrating and hard. So don't get involved with color printmaking. But that was her passion. We have a, um, a great question in the chat that I wanna read. Um, 
Mary Ellen asks, what's the perceived difference in doing something with a friend and hiring an agent? Is it only money? Do men hire people or network with friends? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I would say in, in the period I'm looking at, no one really hired agents um, in, in the in so fact that like, I don't, I, a gallery would maybe be your agent. Um, so I think men had a much easier time getting, getting galleries to take them seriously um, because they had often more time to be producing and making at a consistent clip. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to see in these letters that are, that are in the, these various archives, like um, the rare instances of women interacting with men and making those kinds of networks. It's, it's unusual in my experience. Can I offer a thought about that too? Yes, please. Yeah, just, you know, going back into the previous centuries, you know, networks and friends and friendship was one of the only ways women were able to make inroads into those professional spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so they might not have gallery representation or they might not have the financial um, uh, ability to, to um, have an independent practice. A great example here in Philadelphia is the Red Rose Girls, who, you know, were professional illustrators and created their very domestic uh, situ uh, situation together so that they could help each other's careers and have viable, successful careers. So I think of, of networks of women as a, a sort of a, a, at least very, very predominant in the 19th century that these 20th century women were adapting. But definitely it is, it is very gendered, but there were also probably, there were also, you could trace networks of men too, through social clubs and dealers and uh, things like that. But it's also interesting to, you know, when you, when you talked about, um, uh, and Ryan and Warden Day, it's it's really fascinating to think about, you know, even today that you that you still have these kinds of networks. I mean, I think about how often I, as a curator, um, will learn about an artist um, from another artist saying, um, oh, you know, whose work is really incredible that I wish more people would pay attention to. Um, and then they'll name someone in that way, or a, or a collector might do that. There's a, there's a kind of, um, you know, there's a continued salience of of that that practice, that networking practice that still um, comes out in the work that we do, um, and I think is reflected in the you know the fact that we we are doing this in association with the show of prints that are gifted to PAFA by a phenomenal uh, woman, Ophelia Garcia. Um, I wanted to ask Ophelia if you had a anything to add or any questions for us while we're while we're talking about <laughs> women's networks and art well hold on well uh, first let me say that it's a, a terrific experience to uh, see these old friends now on your walls um i uh so i'm uh, and it was a surprise and i'm delighted uh, to see them um I found that uh, early on in my collecting, I collected anything I was interested in. Uh, and as time passed, I began to give prints away. Um, I, I like to say I gave my men to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And when I moved back to Philadelphia, I came with uh, the works by women because I had a sense that together, um, it might have an impact in a way that that separately they might not. And that's just the ignorance and, and the failure of institutions and others to collect along the way. Um, so, so I began to see a relationship between the works and then the women uh, only as I was paying attention. Um, I didn't start out assuming those connections. Um, I think the workshop arrangement that is um, 
are so basic to printmaking. Uh, I myself have been one. Um, I um, it gives you the ability to work with other people and pace yourself as you know somebody's printing, somebody's inking, somebody else is uh, doing working on a plate, etc. So there is a tradition of of working together that doesn't happen in certain other forms of art. And I think that there was a, a um, that for many women, it, it was a comfortable way of operating, um, that the, the links among artists might have been uh, informally stronger um, because of the medium and its requirement that you didn't necessarily have a press, that you used presses in other, uh, in workshops. Um, I am, I'm learning, uh, I did not know of the uh, Atelier Seventeenth <coughs> connections of certain of the artists mentioned, uh, and um, so I need to look uh, look some more. Uh, I'm glad to think that uh, the one market longer that I groom that I had I gave to Pafa years ago. Yeah, it's, um, uh, two minutes to one. Whoops. Uh, I'm babbling, I am told. Anyway, thank you so much for this. This was very interesting. I really appreciate it. Um, you definitely were not babbling, Ophelia. <laughs> it was very interesting. We have a couple people that have unmuted themselves. Are there more questions to bring in? I have a question, but I also may have noisy children in the background, so excuse them. <laughs> oh, no. um, <laughs> my question is, uh, if during your research, if you found any examples of the lineage of these women still being present in the printing community today, an example where you may have found a woman and uh, that viscosity printing or something on the atelier still being used in the school associated in where she ended up living or something like that. The lineage still maintaining its, its ground even though the woman herself may have been invisible to the rest of us. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, a lot of these women were um, not, not around by the time I started, but um, I, as soon as I figured out like who their people were um, and I could get myself in touch with them, um, you see, that their legacies were continued in printmaking workshops, um, in friendships, in work that those friends who I did get to talk to got to make. Um, so I'm thinking in particular, somebody like Sue Fuller um, has had a, a sort of lasting impact on how people make prints. I mean, if you go to a printmaking workshop um, you'll see often a, a jar of carol corn syrup um, in the cupboards because it's something she helped to sort of perfect a method of making um, lift ground etching. Um, so yeah, her presence is still in printmaking workshops. Um, you know, and, and these, again, these legacies of, of women in the printmaking field are still very strong. Um, it's something that I, eventually hope to be able to tackle work on um, women becoming really leaders in, in the print field in the in the 80s and the 90s and even into today. But you know, they wouldn't have gotten there without the role that these women at Atelier 17 and other um, printmaking studios, like because of them, it's because that we have women in printmaking today. Thank you. I think that's beautiful when the lineage of a group of people or an artist carries on in that way. And the more that people like you talk about them or spread that knowledge out, it just continues to grow and build that hunger for others to want to look into their background. And uh, I remember I was at the at the academy and uh, looking at things like uh, Morris Blackburn's work was still floating around at the time. And that's my mentor, Pat Witt. That was her mentor. And when the lineage of things like that carry on, I think it's just, it's beautiful. Yeah. 
Thank you. Well, I, I see we're at one o'clock. So um, I think that's a great place to, to end with, you know, thinking about lineage and, and how the work continues on. I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us today for this, for this noon talk. Uh, extra special thanks to Dr. Weil and your incredible work here. Um, I think that we'll all be thinking about this and, and reading about this for a while. Um, again, special thanks to Ophelia Garcia for continuing to be an incredible partner in the arts um, as we do this work and spawning this conversation. Um, and I hope everyone else has a great rest of your day. Thank you.